beginning of the year, it was like a you know, you know ca- cataclysmic uh, <laughs> confirmation of those trends. You know, f- call it fear of missing out, call it confirmation of trends, call it a uh, you know uncertainty resolution, call it whatever you want to call it. We had what we have been observing until this day, right? And I think that's the pivotal shift. That is what made, in my view, the substantial regime shift in the um, in the market and trend. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today Robert Carver and I are joined by Nick Baltus, who is a managing director at Goldman Sachs and who has done a lot of research and practical work in the systematic investment space. So first off, Nick, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we've very much been looking forward to this conversation. How are you doing? How are things where you are? I, I understand there's a little bit of turbulence where you are today. <laughs> There is indeed. I mean, uh, you know, the day is the 20th of October and, uh, you know, we just had the prime minister resigning, I think, in a, in a record time. So in a, it's definitely a, uh, let's call it eventful day uh, more than anything else. But, um, you know, setting that aside, you know, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan and it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's definitely wonderful to have you. Rob, I know you're in the same place, so I imagine you've also been uh, preoccupied today with following uh, what's going on. Yeah, I was I was starting to think that um, our well, she's still technically our prime minister was was going to kind of drag it out all afternoon, and I was kind of sitting in front of the television thinking, "I oh, really, uh, you know, come on, Liz, get on with it. I've got I've got a podcast to do at three o'clock, so this come on, just crack on." But she obviously heard me because she she came out at one thirty and, and resigned, so I was, I, could, I was able to watch a bit of the analysis before before starting today. So um, that's probably the only thing that she's done right in her forty four days in power, to be honest. But there we go. Great stuff. All right. Well, we have other juicy topics uh, on the agenda today, for sure, to discuss. But I thought, Nick, maybe just for the audience to get a little bit uh, to know you and and your background, perhaps you can just share a few of the highlights of your path to uh, to where you are today. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, happy to do so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Greek, born and raised, uh, you know, in Athens, uh, in a beautiful place, uh, great weather. You know, I spent 24 years of my life there. Um, I basically did uh, electrical and computer engineering in the National Technical University over there. And then, you know, I wanted to do like a master's and I came to London, um, did a master's in signal processing communications. Uh, I was still an engineer at the time, um, you know, and then, you know, I had to do like the military service and I went back home, you know, worked uh, for a year with my with my father, but then kind of come, came back. And that was 2007, and like literally when Northern Rock uh, kind of blew up, um, you know, for a PhD in finance. You know, that was that was the time, right? That was the time. Uh, I spent um, those four years, you know, again at Imperial College. That was uh, at the business school, doing work primarily in equity, momentum, correlation, risk, and trend following. Um, you know, those also the days for trend following. And if you remember, obviously, you know more than I do. Uh, I know the growth uh, that this space has had during those years. Um, I spent a few more years after that, you know, continuing academic research in the same space. Uh, you know, having an academic career, lecturing, uh, all sorts of things. You know, in the business school. And then I kind of decided to move to the industry. That was 2013, I believe, about 10 years ago. I moved to UBS, um, spent another five years doing sell-side research on quantitative quality asset. And over the last five years, I've been uh, you know, within the Goldman Sachs ecosystem, um, part of structuring you know, within the markets division. Um, you know, my team is basically responsible for building systematic strategies that we make available to institutional investors uh, globally. Um, you know, we can go into more specifics, but that's the, a quick path um, through time. It was, Partly coincidental kind of moves, partly I would you know I would also call it like luck, partly some sort of longer term strategic uh, kind of thinking as to what the next step should be. So there you are. 
I think a lot of people end up in our industry a little bit coincidental and, and by luck. I'm not sure people wake up uh, in their youth saying, yeah, I really want to do trend following. <laughs> That's certainly true of me, I have to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, although curiously, I was just thinking I actually left the industry kind of as a, an employee in 2013, just as Nick was coming in and amongst other things and I am a part-time academic so we've almost reversed roles but uh, I'm a big I forgot didn't get a chance to say at the beginning Nick I'm a huge fan of your work and I'm really looking forward to this talk so yeah no that's that's a great pleasure that's a great pleasure I only you know I only moved eventually to um, you know just because you mentioned right it was 2013 you know when I moved to UBS and that was the time that you know one of the more uh, kind of senior professors at Imperial uh, at the time he was a part-time he was you know full-time kind of um, kind of working at at UBS and he decided to move back and it, it's almost as if it was swapped uh place in like that James Sefton he was a great guy a great mentor yeah no absolutely now as you rightly suggest you've written a lot of research and I would add you've written a lot of great research uh, on various systematic trading strategies and but of course our focus today may gravitate towards trend following since we all love uh, to be in that space but even if there are kind of uh, different articles from this year that really triggered my wish uh, uh, for having you on the podcast, I wouldn't mind if we could go back to your uh, UBS days and dig into uh, the archives a little bit, um, because you wrote you wrote something maybe seven, six, seven, eight years ago in 2015 or 16, uh, correct me uh, on that, on a topic that actually comes up quite often. And I have a feeling it might come up very soon again, because often when markets go south, especially if there's a little bit of volatility, um, media and, and other participants have a, a kind of a, um, a habit, let's put it that way, of blaming CTAs for magnifying the negative price action. So especially if it's happening in stocks and bonds. So do you mind taking us a little bit back in, in into those days before we we catch up uh, on time and and sort of what you found to be true or not true about these things? Yeah, sure. So I guess that all goes back to, you know, the market is turning south, you know, in whatever form or fashion. And then you have like some sort of market commentary talking about trend followers and kind of risk parity fans and, you know, volatility targeting. And broadly speaking, whatever type of allocation models that would, you know, start selling in some form or fashion, kind of trying to go hand in hand with those market price moves, right? I guess my point at the time was more about, okay, let's let just look through into the numbers and let's try to understand exactly what is happening here because it's easy to say, well, you know, if I'm following a trend and the trend is negative and guess what, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go with it, um, you know, for a particular reason. Um, and obviously the question is how much supply and demand is out there you know, to, to, you know, to make my move more substantial than, you know, that the aggregate supply. And basically what I started from is like, let's look into trend, right? Trend is not anticipatory, right? It's a price taker, right? We're just expecting things to move and should they move and confirm a direction, then we're gonna deploy the exposure. So first things first, they cannot create a downturn, right? So it's purely exogenous, right? And we're not gonna talk about what is actually causing it. All we're gonna talk about now is that suppose that this turn did turn uh, and it did happen and we have like a negative move, then you know there's a few mechanical things that happen and are not, in my view, special to trend following, right? Trend following would say, well, here's a negative trend, you know, to the extent that I have conviction upon it, based on my rules, based on whatever the market is doing, I'm going to start selling to effectively benefit from the move, and you know, in some form or fashion, that's what gives convexity to those strategies. If we look into you know risk parity funds, well, they say, well, I want to allocate inversely proportional to my volatility. So if the market is falling and the volatility is going up, the so-called leverage effect, uh, which, by the way, this dual causality, um, you know, it, price can drive risk or risk can drive price. But, you know, setting that aside, I'm going to reduce my exposure. By the way, it's the same thing that a stop loss rule would do, right? You say, OK, I'm hitting my stop loss. I'm going to sell, right? So there's some form of risk management that comes into play, even for a long only investors that will start reducing the exposure to whatever asset they hold, if they have either some stop losses in place or some sort of, you know, rules to just just stop the bleeding. You know, if I were to quote, um, you know, your guest from from two weeks back, uh, you know, basically, you, know, you need to be a quitter, and you know, you need to be confident about quitting at times and have a rule that you kind of follow because you know that brings brings discipline, right? So 
that was kind of the initial point. The point was that, you know, listen, there's so many mechanical, either systematic or discretionary uh, features that can create a selling, um, you know, a selling pressure in the market. But then let's look more carefully as to how impactful that can be, right? In reality, what we have to look at is what's the positioning, how are risk models calculated, and at the end of the day, what is the specifically equities, because people talk about mainly equities, right? What is the equity exposure of all those type of investments? And then what's the delta on that equity that has to be sold, right? So once you just try to carve out what is that portion, and that's the work that we did back then, you end up realizing that it's just a very small portion, given some assumptions about risk models, assets, and so on and so forth. It's a small proportion of what the overall market really is. And I think there's also a very uh, subtle point, uh, which was highlighted to me on the back end of all this work by one of the, you know, one of the founders of one of the largest CDAs. Um, basically, the claim goes as follows: trend followers scale by volatility or by risk, right? If you're in a down market, like in the present moment, and you have a significant reduction in the price that comes together with a volatility spike, what you're actually doing is reducing your growth, so you're buying back. So if anything, not only do you not intensify the down move, you're actually acting as a support to the market. So again, to, to, to cut a long story short, I can go on forever on this topic, but to cut a long story short, my point was, let's take a step back. Yes, mechanically, it can be the case, but you know, you have to really look into the idiosyncrasies of all those different features and then claim that they orchestratedly, if that word kind of exists, and like they work as an orchestra to effectively start selling to create a substantial down move. Um, so uh, I, I was trying to basically defend the space and, 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 and I just wanted to just bring another type of, um, of a voice in this, um, in this dialogue. Yeah, I guess if you widen that research out beyond equities, because obviously if you look at the you know, equities and what percentage of equity free float or volume is CTAs, it's going to be a pretty small number, right? Even if you do a kind of look through from equity indices to underlying equities, it's going to be a pretty small number. But I do wonder in some of the less liquid futures markets whether there is some, you know, mileage in this story. Um, I mean, we, you know, all CTAs, especially big ones, worry about being too big a part in the market, right? So crowding is is a concern. I mean, I think it would be irresponsible not to be concerned about it. You know, to, so, you know, is the CTA industry just not big enough to have this effect or is it is it to do with the dynamics or is it because you looked only at equities? You know, what what, what do you think? I mean, certainly when we look into into the space more broadly, um, you know, we can always claim that, you know, you can get into a stage whereby the assets have grown so much to allow for, um, you know, quick rebalancing, right? And therefore, you, know, you can have a, you know, a market impact purely from the perspective of, uh, you know, the mechanics of it, right? Um, now, again, I think we can run the analysis in various ways and, you know, I can I can go into a few more specifics and I could also quote Andrew that was on the show like uh, recently, you know, he kind of also claimed, you know, it, we don't seem to be getting uh, close to those capacity levels and if anything, you know, we're running analysis on a very regular basis, you know, especially where we are here looking into how deep is the market and also how we can inform the allocation to any strategy, trend following is one of them, um, you know, to avoid having uh, substantial consumption of the of the available liquidity. Um, so there's certainly, you know, when we talk about crowding, there's, I think there's like a range of different ways that we can talk about crowding. You know, crowding is more like, we can think about crowding at the industry level, and that's more about, you know, how margin and leverage um, you know, can affect the system in a, in a turning point. That's more of a liquidity crisis and fire sales. We can look into crowding from the perspective of a manager, that it's more about how do I deploy my new capital? And is it now for me the time to just deploy that capital to more liquid, which you know, in the grand scheme of things is lower expected return opportunity. And therefore, you know, being in this position of having to split um, kind of my exposure and possibly have a uh, you know, diminishing return to scale, that's, that's another way of thinking about it. But then we can also look at it in isolation, how a particular strategy can react uh, you know, in, a, in a period that is experiencing inflows. And I think that's also a very different story. You know, I've, I've, I've done some work back in the days that was in the early days at, at Goldman Sachs, really looking into how crowding is impacting systematic investing. And I think there's some very nice features 
I was kind of trying to defend again the space, kind of saying, listen, crowding can have an impact, but you know that impact is not necessarily a negative impact. You know, if anything, any systematic uh, premium, you know, almost requires systematic flows into it to justify. Uh, you know the you know the existence and the presence of it, right? You know, if I do something and nobody else does it, guess what? It's not it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be rewarded in one way or the other. Or the other. So I think, I guess I'm kind of going longer here, but there's many ways we can look into crowding. There's liquidity consumption. There is diminishing returns to scale, but there's also strategy mechanics. And you know, different answers would have different questions. So I think you know we we should more broadly be uh, you know careful and 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 look at it in isolation. Yeah, I mean personally, I'm always more worried about crowding in, you know, like a like a relative value strategy with leverage, for example. Um, and obviously, very recently in the UK, we've had this LDI pensions hedging issue, which is kind of a. In fact, I'm going to use the LDI thing in my my slides for my students next semester. I'm going to replace my old example, and here's here's a brand new example for you guys of crowding a relative value trade with leverage, which is just just you know results in these so called doom loops. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, fair. and um, that was like pure, pure liquidity, pure liquidity for itself. Yeah, and it's exactly. not a solvency thing, right? In my view. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's it's definitely more of a problem when it's when it's relative value, and therefore that it needs means you need higher leverage. You know, obviously not for a pure hedging strategy at LDI, but if you're trying to kind of juice a small basis, a few basis points of return into a decent size return by using leverage because you you think you've got a pure arbitrage, right? You think you're doing a, a pure, purely correlated hedge. Well, why do you think, and this is perhaps more of a, this is not a research question, right? This is a kind of, this is a question I'm asking you because you you know, you're, you're in the business of the, being at the sharp end of trying to sell these kinds of strategies to people and you've probably got a better idea of it than I have but one thing that's always mystified me I, I would bet you any money that the you know if you think about crowding and 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 or if you think about market moves being um, kind of amplified and and turned into you know big pushes by something happening it's almost certainly more likely to be something like option hedging you know um, but we never you know it's, if the market's plunging downwards rapidly it's promise. It's not. You're right. It's not going to be CTAs selling. I just they're just they're just not big enough, and they don't react fast enough. It's more likely to somebody who's you know sold something out of their money, and and the, the strike's creeping really close, and they're just just panicking. Um, or you know, not that's not strictly true. Their models are telling them to hedge, and that's the hedging that's required. So what, why why do you think the kind of media or interest out there, or the the kind of popular financial opinion out there, is oh yes, it's these horrible risk parity and trend following people, and no one ever meant, no one ever seems to mention the option hedges. I think the only time anyone's ever kind of mentioned them was in the whole, you know, the kind of gam- GameStop kind of story about. Yeah, about the short squeezes, right? Blowing out the short squeezes, and that's the the only time in the popular imagination I can I've kind of heard that story. Well, why do you think that is? I think it's immediate information, right? I think that's 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 what it is. I think it's more behavioral than 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 actually looking into the specifics. I, I don't I don't think I have a better answer. Um, I just genuinely think you know, following like you know thirty forty years of uh, you know Goldilocks, right? You know the sixty forty portfolios, and we know how they're performing the year to date. And you know, eventually giving rise to risparity portfolios, and you know, benefiting possibly from this kind of vol scaling, and then kind of like then taking that and expanding it on the multi-asset case, and then the popularity of all those multi-asset allocation schemes just happened to be mechanically, uh, you know, the first should I call it resort, uh, but certainly the first, <laughs> um, the first that came to mind, right, in some respect. And possibly because it's more systematic. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think I think it's the fact that it's systematic. And this is rules based more so than anything else that, you know, sometimes can make some people uncomfortable. I mean, I think it's a combination of things. I I don't disagree with any of the things you've said. Um, I also think there is just generally uh, perhaps a lack of understanding of what we really do uh, uh, by journalists. Uh, And and I'll share an example, and that is a very recent example uh, where we were contacted by a journalist uh, asking us, Oh, so did you sell a lot of sterling um, because of what's going on with the uh, prime minister um, and the tech and the mini budget? And and they were I, they were really surprised to learn that we went short sterling. I can't remember if it was sterling or, or gilts. Doesn't really matter. But like in Q four of last year, <laughs> and so. Um, but going back to your point, I mean, I think I think we as an industry 
okay, maybe we, we push prices a little bit around the entries if the entries are very clear and you know that a lot of trend-following approaches will be more or less getting in at the same time. But this is at a time where there is no big hoo-ha and there's no big trend at this time. This is like the the little breakout that we see, but most of the world don't see. Um, and, and, and all the press and all the popularity, as you rightly said, Nick, that comes towards the end of the trend when, when it gets painful, um, and it's, uh, you know, maybe at an extreme point and you need to find someone to blame or some, something to explain it by. I think then because we don't have any story or narrative to share, I think we're kind of an easy, um, victim of that. And it's it's in the news rise as well, right? You know, once once you do that well, once you do that well, then you know the, the mechanical nature talks about you know obviously it's like um you know definitely crowded. But I agree with you, and I think you had this point with Richard recently, right? About like, I guess you kind of enter in a similar region, you know, once you enter a trend, you know, more or less. But you know, the reality is, as you say, right, it's just a formation that just crosses a threshold and just makes it more more reasonable for for anyone to enter. But again, what I'm going to stress is the point I made earlier on. In the presence of very strong trends in either side, what you'll end up doing is cutting down, right? So you know, and we saw it this year. Yeah, and I think that is another point. And of course, on this podcast, we have a lot of debate about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I, I agree with you. I think most managers today have some kind of dynamic position sizing, and therefore, we would act, actually act completely opposite of what most people think during those times so definitely i want to stay on this on this point a little bit um it could be from a um i think this is from your most cited paper uh, which is part of your phd um as far as i recall and um because it's kind of related to what i'm hoping will happen namely that finally 2022 will be the year where people realize that having trend following in their portfolio is not optional anymore. It's essential, as Andrew uh, has uh, said uh, on the podcast last week. And so I think in that paper, um, one of the things you uh, looked at was also capacity constraints. And I think actually, and this is a, f a, f a fair uh, question um, that people should be aware of, and certainly I, I hope managers are aware of, in, in their own ability to navigate uh, these markets uh, with their own size and 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 the liquidity we 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 hear uh, people talk about how the open interest, for example, in the oil markets have gone down a lot, and does that impact quote unquote the liquidity that we have to you know um, that we benefit from uh, when as managers? So, talk to me a little bit, or talk to us a little bit about kind of what you found about capacity and and how to even measure it and. And just anything you really want to talk about. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a very nice story about this work. I mean, you know, if we go back to 2009, right, uh, that's about, I think that was about the time or possibly early 2010. Um, you know, I was doing all the work on, you know, equity single stock momentum and, you know, whether those uh, kind of equity factors are somehow correlated with uh, correlation risk premium. Uh, you know, and there was like another world, uh, obviously unrelated to my work. That was obviously the trend following world uh, that had done extremely well in 2008. Obviously, you know, taking all those short positions in equities and long positions in bonds throughout 2007, and obviously when when the big hit came, they were uh, extremely well positioned. Obviously, attracting a lot of interest. Obviously, I think that was the big kind of exponential growth in the assets. And then 2009, more like 2010, kind of came through. With like performance kind of started becoming a bit more mediocre and then you know, obviously after the fact we know with the benefit of hindsight we know that it was you know the early days of the fed boot but at the time um there was a lot of publicity you know in in in, in all financial media that you know hey the cta space the trend following space you know it has grown so much uh and therefore we have like some sort of possibly capacity issues you know and i happened to cross paths at the time with a uh, an incredible guy, um, you know, he's still in the city industry. Um, you know, he's been part of the two or three largest CTAs. Um, I could, I could, I could possibly name him, but anyway, he kind of came to me as a, as an informal advisor and he told me, listen, look at this paper. He basically gave me the, the working at the time version of, uh, you know, Toby Moscovitz, um, Owen Peterson paper on, on time series momentum. Like, listen, this is a way that some of those trend following strategies work. But what is more interesting for us these days is like 
can you just do an analysis on capacity, right? Can you just have some sort of a think as to how we could look into you know in this space, given the AUM is kind of following, uh, is following it, or whether we have you know we're hitting capacity. So you know, I did two things. Uh, I was working back then, you know, with my advisor uh, Robert Kozowski. You know, we still um, are very close in contact, and we still kind of try to, to do some work from now, from time to time. So we said, okay, there's two ways we can do it. Right? The first way is more like the academic way, which basically says, well, let's run a regression, the so-called performance flow regression. So you look into flows at t minus one, you look at the return at time t. We can call t minus one last month, last three months, last year, whatever. And then let's look into the return the month after or the three months after, right? And basically the story here is that, you know, if the flows have an impact on performance, you should expect some sort of negative exposure you know, between the two variables, statistically significant. We found nothing, right? So we looked into the flows. So we took a um, CDA database. We took the returns of each and every CDA. We took, obviously, the assets. And then you can back out, you know, the net of flows. Sorry, the net of return uh, change in AUM is obviously the flows, right? So we isolated the flows for the last, you know, at the time, I think, 20, 30 years. We did this analysis. We didn't find anything. So there was no statistical relationship. There was no significant relationship. There was no even a point estimate that was either negative through time. If you were to run it on a rolling basis, it was going to go in positive and negative. So there was no uh, no information whatsoever. The second thing we did, which I think was even nicer, was the following. We basically said, let's assume, for the sake of illustration, right, that the entire industry is following the same model. Right, and this same model says, okay, I have like those 50, 60 markets. Um, I have like a look back window of X months. I'm sizing my exposure, you know, using historical volatility by that level, and you know, I have a price path of the strategy. And then from the 70s onwards, I also have the AUM growth. So at the end of every month, I can assume that this level of AUM is invested in that strategy. So I can literally break down the dollar amount into how many contracts I would require for each and every constituent. And then I can compare that month on month with the open interest. So I have 80 assets or 60 assets or whatever number of assets per month through time to find how many times do I actually go past or do I become more than a small fraction of the open interest. So just for clarity, you're effectively pretending that there's only one CTA Yep. Yeah, it was yeah, that has it, all the AUM and it's investing in this one strategy. Precisely, it's like an oversimplifying cool. assumption. Uh, I think you know in this show it has been mentioned many times. Uh, a, a trend follower is a CTA, but no, all CTAs are trend followers, right? Uh, and I think it's very, very important to make this in this clarification. So in this regard, we basically said let's get the AUM through time. I cannot recall if it was just for CTAs or systematic CTAs, but anyway, it's like 90, 92%, you know, it's systematic anyway. Um, and let's assume that they are following a simplistic uh, formulaic trend following strategy. And then let's look at the asset level, how many times you would have crossed a proportion of the open interest. We found too little to none, right? It was a minuscule proportion per market. There were some markets, you know, I don't know, lumber, for example, that you would find potentially some months that you would kind of cross, again, in a theoretical sense, the open interest. But then again, back to your point, Rob, these are like liquidity assumptions that anyway would enhance the models by when we're to run them. Yeah, so I guess you're assuming that, I guess, what, equal weighting across markets in your hypothetical CTA? That would be uh, when you say markets, uh, you know, within uh, the same asset class or across uh, the board. Uh, sorry, well, so how did you how did you allocate the risk across in this hypothetical CTA? How did you allocate the risk between, say, lumber and platinum and gold and so on? It was done on an inverse vol basis. I so uh, e equally equally weighted though equally the, weighted. the risk. E risk, right? So, so that that's kind of the you're basically saying if a CTA was stupid enough to put the same amount of money in, you know, oh yeah, hundred percent, yeah, yeah, super liquid euro dollars and not very liquid lumber then surprise, surprise, they would have too much money in lumber and they'd be exceeding the open interest, which, you know, is not is not a huge surprise. I guess I get I guess the when I think about the, the these capacity constraints, the interesting thing for me is if I imagine that there's some kind of idealized portfolio I'd like to run. Uh, and this is no longer true for me now. I'm, I'm running retail money and I'm at the opposite end of the spectrum where I don't have enough cash to to actually trade futures properly. But, you know, if we go back to 10 years when I was 
trading, you know, real money, proper money, you know, 10 figures. The, you know, the, the way I think about it is, well, there's an idealized portfolio I'd like to hold that's going to be not that dissimilar from what you've described, right? It's going to be roughly, if, if you know, assuming a hom- homogenous correlation structure and blah, 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 and an equal sharp ratio and equal cost, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to be that different from that, um, from, yeah, just inverse vol, same risk allocation to everything. And then I'm like, well, how far do I have to depart from that, given that I do have this huge pile of money? You know, so I was trading fixed income. So, you know, it, we, I don't think our smallest market might be something like, I don't know, five-year Indian swaps, you know. So clearly we couldn't put as much money into that as we could into T-bills. Um, so, you know, that that's that was the that's the kind of way that these, the way to think about this capacity issue, I think. Completely. And I think, um, I cannot recall, but there's like a couple of... Um a couple of academic papers that look into the impact of costs. And I think what they do is they say, okay, what is my ideal portfolio X costs? Let me include now costs and let me minimize the tracking error to what I want to be close to after accounting, obviously, for, for, those, um, you know, for, those, for those dynamics. So I, I completely agree with you. So I don't know if we can do this, actually, but we can try. So let's just say for argument's sake that the official CTA AUM as tracked by Barclay Hedge, they probably have the best... Even though a lot of that actually is Bridgewater, which I've never really considered as a CTA, but leave that as it may be. Uh, let's just say that we are at whatever, 375 billion, which hasn't really moved for like 10 years, frankly. Given where the markets are, and, and you may know this much better than I do, but given where the size of the underlying markets are today, and I know that there will be people like yourself, Nick, who obviously also do trend following, but don't appear in these statistics. So I'm fully aware that the real AUM that does trend following will be bigger than what Barclay Hedge is is, uh, is tracking. But how, at current market liquidity, whatever we call it, levels, how, how big do you think? Can we even say how big we think that the kind of trend following community could be without having any impact on markets, really? It's a good question. Um, I mean, just to put some numbers in perspective, um, and, and, and I agree with you. Like, the, and you may have better numbers than I do, frankly. No, I, I, so I, I, so I feel think free we have the same numbers in the sense. Like, I think I think in the CTA, uh, at least whatever Barclay Hedge is kind of reporting it. So I think it's about like three fifty the systematic, and then three seventy five is basically the whole kind of the whole the whole space. Yeah, and two hundred of that, of, of something like that, is Bridgewater or close. So it, again, but it's kind of all adding up, I guess, in 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 those numbers. You know, if I look into kind of other places that you can have some form of you know trend following capacity in 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 this way or the other, I'd possibly just round this number to the four hundred, give or take. Um, and I don't think it's just larger than that. Um, and when we think about you know the the hedge fund industry as a whole, which is about what like. 34 trillion at the moment, probably. So we're talking about like 10% of that, right? Now, I think I don't think it's the easiest thing uh, for us to just put out a number. And and also, you know, if we take into account the cross-sectional differences between all those CDAs, I mean, they're not all doing the same thing. Some are like much more shorter term, some are like more longer term. I think that also should be fed into how much of that we could potentially see as a multiple. But I would not suggest that, you know, we're anyway approaching any 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 problematic levels. Again, I don't think it's a um, it's a straightforward answer. Um, it's 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 more about you know market sense. You know, looking into liquidity numbers, looking into um, you know how liquidity um, profiles change from from day to day, month to month, or year on year. I do not think we're anyway approaching. I'm not sure what's your opinion actually. Right. On this one. I'm... Yeah, no, I'd love to hear Rob's as well, but I just want to add something. Um, actually, our good colleague at at uh, at, at Top Traders, he um, Alan Don, uh, when he worked for Abbey, they did a really good paper on on the CTA industry a few years back, and I think from memory um, that they adjusted for some of those things you mentioned about. Well, then there's managers doing something completely different. So how much is real, say, kind of trend following? I think they got the number down to about 125 billion was the Is real right? number, even with the uh, in, within the CTA community. Now, I will say, I think the industry was a little bit smaller back then because of uh, it was a, a difficult period we went through. And, and obviously, AUM has increased in the last 18 months from just from performance and inflows. But still, it was a lot less in terms of what we see the official number is to what they estimated the real 
kind of trend following number was. Um, but I don't think it. I don't think it matters too much, anyways. There's obviously always going to be some constraints in smaller markets, um, and then there's going to be easier in the bigger markets. What, what are your thoughts, sir? Yeah, I mean, this is it. It's an unanswerable question, really, because you could take the extreme view and say, well, let's stick with futures, actually. Let's not talk about Indian five-year swaps. But you could take something like, I don't know, um, I've just added Way to my data set, um, which barely trades, um, you know, like a couple of contracts a week or something ridiculous like that. It's just ridiculously tiny. So you could say, well, if if let's go back to Nick's um, paper, Highly unrealistic realistic paper, we've agreed. Um, that's fine. Uh, it's still cool. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree. It's a great, it's a cool paper. Um, if you if you included way in his list of markets and you gave that the same allocation as, I don't know, euro dollar or S&P 500 or something, and then you said, well, I'm going to think that the um, um, the, the hedge fund capac- um, industry is at capacity if any single market goes above 10%. Well, you'd you'd be in way you'd be well well above ten percent. You'd be you know be well over a hundred percent in fact. And the, there's probably dozens and dozens of futures markets I could name you where, if the entire CTA industry tried to invest in those, there wouldn't be enough capacity for them to do that. So that that you know so clearly, if if you take that very extreme version of of the capacity argument, which is to say, well, okay, if because the entire CTA industry can't invest in an idealized portfolio with, you know, where there's no constraints on capacity. Therefore, the, you know, the industry is almost by definition always going to be at capacity because there's always going to be futures contracts that aren't liquid enough. Um, if you, if you take, the, you know, so what I'm trying to say is I, it's a really hard question to answer because it, you can either say it's always true, it's always not true. Because clearly if, if fun firms adapt to market conditions and put no money at all in a way and more of their money in S&P 500 or in euro dollars, then they're going to be nowhere near capacity, of course. Um, so, yeah. You make a nice point. I mean, it, it, it just reminds me of this lumber thing, right? The, the, the point that I made on lumber, right? Um, when we looked into the, the stats, I remember back in the days, we were like, okay, if you actually remove lumber from the universe, it would look nicer, right? But that was not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise was to actually look and, and, and report whatever data we had and, and do a look through and understand exactly what we're crossing from an open interest standpoint in the simplified formulation. But to your point, had we removed lumber, guess what? It would look nicer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that wasn't the point to overfeed, right? It was the point exactly. to report something, exactly. right? Exactly. You're right. Yeah. On and I just I just checked, by the way, and last week I think uh, Lumber traded an average of nine contracts a day and, and Way traded six. So there's not really much in it, but yeah. Now, I'm working my way slowly down to the article you wrote, which was published in Financial Times, which caught my attention, Nick. I want to get to that. But before, because we're just talking about liquidity and markets and trends, etc., etc., one topic that I'm coming uh, across quite a lot is this um, debate when investors want to sort of select a manager, uh, and ideally maybe they should select more than one manager, frankly, is this thing about alternative markets, which is somewhat related to liquidity and capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the difference or the pros and cons, the way you see it between managers who choose the three, 400 market universe or uh, funds like the, the firm I work for, where we've kind of stayed to the classical 60-ish markets. Um, how do you see it from where you sit? I mean, we also get a good amount of, of 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 questions as to whether like more exotic should we call it exotic markets or like alternative markets? Like I don't know. Like I just call it alternative, alternative markets. Probably, markets yeah, let's call yeah. them alternative markets. Yeah. And you know, do we put crypto in this? Possibly we do. I don't know. Like you know, could these be, days yeah, there's so many be. markets we can sure. possibly trade on a futures format. I mean, there's there's a few prevailing principles. Principle number one is like the diversification we'll talk about. And principle number two is liquidity, and I think we've discussed quite 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 at length already. Uh, you know, principle number three which is becoming a bit harder now to nail um, is, is, is probability, both from a statistical sense, but also from an economic standpoint of observing trends, right? In, in the respective markets, right? So if we had markets that don't show trendiness and, you know, we can discuss as to whether there is or not trendiness, then, you know, we're only adding diversification, but not performance. So the only, you know, the only benefit is in the sharp ratio terms, 
right? Um, if we're adding markets that you know, still don't perform, but you know they're also less liquid, in a liquidity-informed optimization allocation framework, it's almost as if you're adding nothing, right? And now, I think what is more important is to say, well, is it more likely that those markets will exhibit stronger trends? And I think here we can have a conversation because you know when we start thinking about, uh, you know, when we start thinking about trends and and prolonged moves, you know, from an, I guess from an academic standpoint, and I'm not necessarily uh, kind of just going to stick to it. Why do trends exist, right? In an efficient market uh, scenario, then there shouldn't be any forecasting ability of the past move to the future move. But you know, for whatever reason, there's so many, um, you know, so many reasons why. Uh, you know, trends exist. You know, the one that I kind of like the most is that you know, market typically digest information in a in a more kind of not instantaneous way. Uh, it, it takes some time for news to come in. You know, that piece of news is kind of digested to the extent that this underreaction ends up forming a trend. You end up having you know, fear of missing out and overreaction that kind of comes along with it, right? So there is a a point to be made, which I think is a fair point, that more alternative markets probably have, I would not call it less efficiency, but less, um, I guess, uh, slower um, slower speed of news transmission. And therefore can make a case for, um, you know, for, for, for trendiness. I think that's also the, the claim that, is, um, that exists out there for some of the exotic commodities. Um, I think um, Gresham has a very nice paper as of like two, three years ago uh, talking about those commodities. Um, but ultimately, I think that's what becomes important is, um, is what is the room from a liquidity standpoint to make those trends to the extent that they exist meaningful for the overall portfolio. And I think that's the challenge at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to disagree with anything you said there, Nick, but I will say well, just I from my practitioner's point of view, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> but I just want to say that from a practitioner's point of view, I don't really see any evidence of that. Meaning when I look at managers who trade the three four $400 market portfolios, and if I look at our own performance, I don't see them performing better. Uh, I, f I see them performing at different times, but not better in the long run that's just my observation. which might go down to the fact that you know there's not too much liquidity to make the addition as apparent in the short term it could be that well no to that point though i mean the there is there's obviously for example florin court um which pivoted to trading just alternative markets and have done pretty well although i should obviously disclaim my interest in that i know all the guys that run that fund and uh they're all friends of mine, so I would say that, wouldn't I? Uh, no, I mean, I, I like, I, I do like your story, and it's a story I've heard before. Um, I guess I'm more with Niels in that not so much looking at evidence in terms of looking at fund level returns and saying, "Oh, there's no evidence there." If I actually look at market level returns and I look at the returns of, um, you know, sort of exotic versus non-exotic markets, and we can debate for ages about where you draw the line. You know, is lumber exotic, for example? Um, <laughs> probably not. Um, but um, I, I don't see myself kind of statistically significant evidence that, you know, there might be something there, but it's not really of a statistically significant level. And um, I think I, I think I know I know the guy that did the Gresham, Gresham paper actually, and um, you know I'm not not sure he found statistically significant evidence there either. And part of the problem, of course, is that a lot of these markets have quite short data history compared to the you know we've been trading, you know. I don't know, cable in future since nine, before I was born, for example, um, and before you were born, maybe not before Niels was born, though. Uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so we've got, you know, but whereas for, for a lot of these, you know, more like, well, let's take crypto, let's take Bitcoin. I mean, you could only really meaningfully trade Bitcoin for maybe the last 10 years or so, perhaps Bitcoin spot. Bitcoin futures, we've only got, uh, I think, three and a half years of history on the CME, at least, I have, something like that. It's not It's not many years. It's not. I don't think it's enough to say, you know, and, and I, I rarely see evidence that a market is trendier than another in terms of statistically significant evidence. So I'm personally, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to allocate risk amongst markets, I will include those exotic markets in there, but purely because of the diversification, because I believe the diversification story, because I believe they are relatively uncorrelated. 
I'm certainly personally not going to be putting money, more money into them and kind of tilting towards them a bit more because I believe they've got kind of higher ex, ex ante sharp. For me, I don't buy that story, but we'll see. No, it, it, it's fair. It's fair. And, and and by the way, without digressing the discussion, I think uh, one of the interesting challenges that I have seen in the in the literature for uh, for a trend, because uh, I think it's also you know, good to be like a uh, you know, keep open eyes and, and ears as to you know what comes along as a challenge is that. There is this story talking about, well, is it actually serial correlation that is driving trends or is it just like assets that you know, over the longer term are rewarded or possibly penalized in the opposite sense that you know end up consistently going long and consistently going short, right? And you know, I, I, I buy the argument. I think econometrically it's very hard to, 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 to get a straight answer. But um, that's, that's, you know, that's something that, because you know, you're talking about like markets that are trending. And, and the point is that, is it a reward the risk premium in the longer term? Probably not. Uh, anyhow, but I buy the other serious argument. Okay, so I, I I know you want to jump in here, Rob, but I want to gravitate for the last fifteen minutes we have Nick uh, towards the, the 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 present and and the future for that matter, um, because as I said, you wrote a really great article. Well, you great wrote a great paper that got featured, I think, in the Financial Times, and and I think there are several points that I think uh, are really interesting to discuss. Um, but before we jump into that, Rob, what's on Thank your mind? Thank you. I just really want to squeeze in if I can, um, just as a bit of a change of temporary change of subject. Um, and, and that's the the work you've done on SKU um, as, a, as a predictor of, of future returns, because um, it's a strategy that, that I, I really like. Uh, I really like the story it tells in terms of it's almost a pure risk premium. Like everyone hates SKU. So go buy it. You know, it's a it's a really pure story, and also quite interestingly for me, at least within my own strategies, um, if I look at my returns to year to date, you know, trend falling obviously has done very well. Carry interestingly hasn't done that well, um, but somewhat curiously, Skew's done really well as well. So um, so it's a it's a it's a just if Niels doesn't mind me squeezing in five minutes of non trend following content, I'd really appreciate you kind of giving us your findings because i think uh, it's a nice story for sure um and by the way if you want if you want to stay around for some time i'm happy to do so right so skew i mean th this came along you know we, we did some work with um you know with the, with the u.s public pension you know the paper is now published at general portfolio management so it's it, everything is in the public domain um the story was um there was some nice research done for commodities right uh basically showing that negatively skewed commodities uh outperform less negatively or positively skewed commodities. And by the way, I'm talking about realized skewness, as in, if I look back a year or six months or nine months or whatever, the, you know, some, some recent period, and I estimate realized skewness, you know, simply talking about you know, the, um, you know, how asymmetric the distribution of daily returns is. Um, you know, if I buy those that have the most negative skew, which I can explain by saying, well, they have had more regular negative tails Right than positive ones, I end up outperforming. Now, mechanically, if we think about it, what is actually happening here is that there is a tendency, if it's a rewarded premium, to avoid you know, buying the assets that have had historically more negative tails. And conversely or symmetrically, there has been more appetite for those that have had like positive tail. Now, how do we explain that from, um, from a theoretic uh, economic standpoint? Uh, there is a lot of literature coming from the single stock space talking about preference for uh, you know for stocks that look like um, like a lottery ticket, right? Um, basically, uh, when there's an occasional up move, uh, but happens rarely, I'm still willing to pay a small premium for it. But what I end up doing, if there is excess demand for that, uh, which by the way has been related more to the retail market. Um, as in retailers looking into this type of uh, you know this type of, of stocks with those characteristics, you end up overbuying them. So in equilibrium, their price goes up, the expected return is lower. Now, this you know you can actually claim you know if we're sophisticated enough, we can easily just take advantage of that. But you know short sale constraints, you know can be an explanation for that phenomenon. Now, obviously, you might say, well, wait a second, Nick, now we're talking about futures, right? We can easily go short. Like, how, how, how about that? So here you have like a few, a few other kind of, um, I guess, behavioral stories, uh, which I, I, I very much uh, kind of agree with. There's the cumulative prospect theory that basically says, you know, that's, that's from, from kind of an Antversky, 
um, basically says human beings um, tend to associate small probability events with high probability of occurrence. As in, if something big, either positive or negative, happens very rarely, somehow I perceive it as happening more regularly. Okay, so what is the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is that I'm I would want to go long whatever happens to go up more frequently than what it actually does, but, but because I perceive it to go up more regularly, well, I'm going to go into it, like a Tesla equivalent in some respect. And whatever happens to tank irregularly, but I perceive it to tank more regularly, well, I'm going to avoid it. So in equilibrium, this can give rise to, you know, over um, overpriced positively skewed, underpriced negatively skewed. Um, there are some also other ways you can you can you can justify um, uh, that you can justify the skewness. Um, it's called selective hedging. Uh, basically, that means that you know when I estimate my hedging ratio, I do not want just to reduce overall volatility, but I take into account higher moments. So you know, let's say I'm a commodity producer, uh, right, and I do not want the price to go down, so I'm going to short a futures. I would not want to short the entire exposure if the asset I'm going to hedge, right, typically happens to go up more often than going down in a tail scenario, right? And therefore, I will I would prefer to be under hedged. And conversely, if I'm a consumer, I'm going to be overhead and so on and so forth. So basically, there are some tendencies from a risk management standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint, to give rise to those patterns. To cut a long story short, that was the idea. And we said, well, listen, if that is the case, then possibly we should look into the entire landscape of futures markets. And, you know, if we have evidence that works in you know, single stocks and there's evidence in, in, in commodity futures, then surely we should look into other markets. And by the way, there's so much literature, for example, for the foreign exchange market and downside beta exposures. Uh, so, you know, there was some sort of reasoning to look into the, um, the broader space, um, you know, lo and behold, uh, we do get statistically strong results for, uh, um, for bonds and for equity indices. Um, FX, I must say, is the least, uh, from a statistical standpoint, uh, contributor. Uh, certainly diversification helps out. Rob, back to your point, uh, not the only freelance probably. Um, and, and overall, when we look into a cross-asset skew strategy or a cross-asset skew uh, dynamic, we can possibly look at it as a short term reversal, even though it's not really a reversal. Um, but we can basically look at it as a, uh, a an intertemporal risk transfer between participants willing to continue holding negatively skewed assets versus those that are not willing to do so. So there's a I think there's a there's an economic theoretic uh, kind of uh, support of the premium itself, and it blends nicely with trend. To your point. I do want just to spend the last few minutes on uh, on your most recent article, at least that I've I've seen, um, and uh, and because it's it's about the present. Um, it's a little bit into what you think, why um, this time may be different, even though those, those words are obviously always um, tricky to use. So I'm just going to give you the floor, Nick. Talk to us a little bit about what you wanted to express um, with the paper, the article, and and we'll take it from there. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, how, how, how did this all start, right? I mean, the start of the year was... You know, very strong for trend followers, right? And it was very strong partly because, you know, some of the um, Q4 dynamics around inflation, I'm going to go back to that in a second, started playing out. Obviously, you had like geopolitics for whatever reason, obviously, um, uh, giving fuel to those trends. Um, and then, you know, the months that kind of followed until kind of March or so um, were kind of different. It felt different for a trend follower, right? It started feeling a bit different. Um, and, you know, there was obviously more publicity coming through, you know, the market was not in a, you know, in, in, in a good shape more broadly, but then CTA started kind of helping out. So the point that kind of started raising with some of our, you know, discussions with investors was more about like, it's, it, it, it's kind of performing. Is, is that the right time? Should we kind of go into it? And my point was like, listen, I think just judging on a three or a four or five month period to allocate or not allocate, I think it's wrong. Right. Um, you know, the first thing we need to do is to look back, you know, in the years between 2010 and 2020, because I think there's a big elephant there. 
right? That was a period setting aside some sporadic uh, yet very strong events like 2014, possibly 2019. But broadly speaking, it was not an easy period, right? And I think it's very important to fundamentally address what was happening back then, then look into the shift, the paradigm shift, possibly if there is one, that can justify the performance and subject to us having some conviction upon that continuing, then we can talk about an allocation, right? So I think I just wanted to completely change the dials and say, well, no, 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 it's not performing because you know it just happens to perform. There were reasons why it didn't, there are reasons why it does, and there's possibly conviction why it will continue. So that was, that was if you like, the, the objective, right? Or, or that was the, the inception of all, this, of, all this, uh, of all this work. It's more like an opinion piece in some respect. Um, and then you know, what I tried to do is to basically say, well, the market this year has been so challenging. And by the way, eventually, as you said, you know, went to the Financial Times in July, but I think it kind of still applies you know, to what we're observing. Right? You know, I, I, I was looking into some stats just before the call. I mean, if I look into a 60-40, and you've discussed 60-40 so many times in this in this in these shows, and I don't want to spend too much time on the 60-40, but like 60-40 or any risk parity combination of even even including tips together with equities and bonds or anything even more economic risk balance type of an allocation, any multi-asset diversified portfolio this year is about 20% down, assuming a 10 vol annualized, right? It is really, really, really hard, right? By all means, you know, the inflation dynamics suggest that you know, had you done short rates, short equities, long commodes, give or take, given the, also the historical relationship with those asset classes to, to inflation, you would have done amazingly well year to date. But then the point that I want to make is that, well, is that really a sustainable inflation hedge? Like you cannot maintain that, right? You cannot maintain that portfolio forever, right? Because guess what? You're basically shorting the two well-regarded, rewarded premium, you're sorting equities and a term premium. And then you're basically going long what has historically been primarily in contango, so commodity markets, right? So sustaining that exposure just to play the inflation theme, I think it's quite stretched, right? So what I want to kind of highlight here is that probably we would require more active, more dynamic allocation schemes. Probably trend following starts becoming a way to dynamically adjust exposures as a function of the recent move. And you know, if you want to look into regime indicators, possibly the price is one indicator, right? But then if that is the claim, then why does it work, right? And why it didn't work or not necessarily didn't work, but you know why it was challenged for like 10 years, right? Or whatever, those periods, you know, you can basically you know, uh, look into whatever period you would want. But broadly speaking, in those 10 years, it was challenging. So. Here's the story, right? I mean, we, uh, you've talked about the Fed put, you've talked about, you know, the quantitative easing, you've talked about you know, all those features that, you know, were prevalent in, in, in those 10 years. I think it's more important for, the, um, for our discussion just to mention a few uh, claims that have been made for the underperformance that, in my view, and also based on the research, are not valid. So crowding, it wasn't the case, right? You know, crowding, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, was the first reason that came through. So it wasn't crowded, crowd, crowding uh, that led to underperformance. It wasn't even reduced diversification. That was also another claim. Um, you know, back to Rob's point, diversification did the job. It wasn't even you know, efficacy of signals to pick the moves, should the moves uh, um, happen. So none of those, even though they have been put forward as explanations, uh, seem, seem to hold, right? What happens to hold, mechanically speaking, is that, well, markets were not in a trendy fashion, broadly speaking. When they were trending, you had more frequent breaks. And even when they were trending, the magnet was not very big. Now, all of that is very mechanical, right? All I'm saying is that if something doesn't trend, hey, it's not going to perform, obviously. But there's a fundamental reason underneath, and that is the Fed put, right? Now, why the Fed put, right? And I think I think that's the important that's the important point. The Fed put was in some respect, you know, an element of fundamental certainty, right? There was either action or anticipation of an action if things go south, right? Now, in this environment, basically all I'm saying is that, you know, I have a, an, you know, a price target of 100, but we kind of all agree about this 100. I mean, Rob might say, you know, 99, Niels, you might say 101, but guess what? The distribution of our forecast of an asset price is, you know, 
is pretty tight in terms of disagreement. In this particular case, there's a lot of agreement. And in this environment, if the price moves for whatever reason, VIX spike in 2018, it's more likely to come back. So if you think about it in, in the Bayesian world, this is our view. There's news coming to it, but the only action that really happens in the market is that, you know, you know what, something's going to come in. Either they do come in or I anticipate them to come in, pushing the price back to my conviction. And I think 2018 was like a great example. You know, the market starts all time high, have the VIX spike. Then by June, all time high, you have the Q4, you know, spot down, vol down. 2019, another all time high. So it's kind of this wiggling around that always you kind of keep on hitting higher and higher points, right? Whereas conversely, what we see today or these days is a complete shift to fundamental uncertainty. Like, I don't think any pair of us three or possibly even more agree whether we're currently, you know, with high inflation risk, low inflation risk, soft landing, hard landing, no landing, whatever landing. I think there's so much uncertainty. And by all means, this uncertainty, it can create price moves that contain information, right? So now we might still agree 100 is a price target, but Ro might say, no, I think it's 80. And Nielsen might say, it's 120. So what happens here is that, you know, if you have a price move, it's more likely that the distribution flows with it. So the price becomes sustained and this sustained move becomes more likely to be prolonged. And guess what? Systematically harvesting those moves is what makes trend work, right? So the fundamental uncertainty, in my view, is fundamental for trends to exist, right? Macro uncertainty, macro volatility. We did some work back in the um, back in my you know, back in my previous days uh, that I think really you know, you know, hits the nail on the head on this one. We were looking into single stock reversal strategies, right? You you, know, you buy the short term losers and you sell the short term winners high turnover strategy, expensive on costs. So we're thinking, okay, how can we make this strategy better? And my colleagues you know if and when they listen to the show, they're going to remember that. And you know, we made this hypothesis. The hypothesis went along the following line. If you want reversal in the short term, surely you need volatility, no? Like mechanically speaking. Okay, fine. So why don't we pick the most volatile stocks and do a reversal strategy? We failed. Like big time. Like big time. Then obviously, you know, because you know it's a zero-sum game, once you get the low volatility stocks or the low beta stocks, then you make it work. And they're like, how is that possible? Well, and then we made this hypothesis which we tested. If low price volatility somehow proxies um, high fundamental uncertainty, how about we build a reversal strategy with stocks that have high, sorry, that have low analyst forecast dispersion. So stocks that the professional analysts kind of agree and the dispersion around the price is pretty much tight, right? And then that was exactly a reversal strategy that was much better than just a plain vanilla one. So that was kind of the link, again, from a Bayesian standpoint of conviction, agreement, consensus, lack of dispersion, giving more confidence that any price deviation from whatever consensus we have becomes more likely to bring it back, right? And obviously, you, know, you, can, you can extrapolate and say, well, obviously, when we go to the other side, high, mon high volatility you know, relates to, to high momentum. So that was a fundamental kind of shift that, in my view, has been established. And the last thing I'm going to say, which I think is also relevant to, to why trends exist and why trends continue, you know, last year, we spent... The whole year, I think, uh, kind of debating on a single word, transitory, right? That was it. Is it here to stay? Is it not here to stay? Like early in April, it was like a base effect. Later on, it became a concern, but then it was transitory. You know, central banks were kind of waiting back. No, it's going to materialize. It's going to uh, normalize. You know, I, I have in the, um, you know, in the article, a nice chart, um, you know, inspiration came from, um, from a CIO of a UK uh, asset manager. Basically, the idea was, if you go to Google Trends, you know, for those that don't know, Google Trends basically gives you a service whereby you can ask about any word or a sentence, uh, and Google will give you some sort of normalized uh, search interest, right? So, you know, I basically search for inflation and then transitory inflation. And it's so obvious, even though it's so simplistic, that people were just Googling 
transit or inflation for the whole of 2021. And then suddenly, you know, December came, uh, Powell came out and said, you know, let's forget about the world, please. That's it. Let's move on. <laughs> let's fix it. And in, if that debate was happening, you know, debate by itself suggests disagreement, right? And, you know, we had started seeing some activity in the commodity market. Some rallies started, you know, uh, behaving in a particular fashion. Rates started moving in anticipation of, um, of rate hikes. So we had seen this underreaction, right? That's precisely what we saw. Underreaction by some part of the market. And then obviously coming beginning of the year, it was like a, you know, you know cataclysmic uh, <laughs> confirmation of those trends. You know, call it fear of missing out, call it confirmation of trends, call it a, you know, uncertainty resolution, call it whatever you want to call it. We had what we have been observing until this day, right? And I think that's the pivotal shift. That is what made in my view, the substantial regime shift in the um, in the market and trend is just systematically harvesting that. You know, it's quite in, it's quite interesting because I completely agree with you on the fact that we've lost the uh, Fed put um, and and to some extent, thank God for that. That markets maybe will be allowed to um, to find their own uh, path. Um, but actually, only a few days ago, which I don't know if both of you are aware of that, we now have an oil put because the U.S. have been out saying that when we get to $67 or between $67 and $72, they're going to fill up the SPR. So uh, I know it's not quite the same, but there is still a put out there that it seems to be. And another thing I wanted to, to say is that I'm definitely going to go to Google Trends after our recording and, rec and, and search trend following to see if there's any hope. But my real question to you, Nick, was... When you talk to your clients, for example, do they, be, I wouldn't say believe is not the right word, but do they, do they sense, do they see that maybe this strategy trend following not, you know, kind of going back to where we started is not optional anymore. It's essential. Or for those who know it, do they see the difference and kind of agree with you and and therefore also concluding that the, the at least this is my view as well. I I I talk about it as globalization being over and 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 things like that. Um, do do they do they kind of also agree that we may be in a period where opportunities at least for these divergent strategies will be so much better? Famous last words, of course. So much better than than what we've seen uh, in the last 10, possibly 20 years, where we had this extreme carry regime. Do they, is there any hope? Uh, I mean, certainly, right? I think a uh, think testament to that is how difficult and challenging asset allocation has been this year, right? Um, and I think, you know, another reason of, I guess, kind of asking your question, which is sometimes what we hear from, from some of the investors, like, is it too late, right? And I think mm, exactly. my answer here is that that's not the right question, right? Because first of all, we you know we have no 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 crystal ball. Certainly for the short term, right? So the the short term, again, as we said in the beginning, it's 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 not anticipatory. It's kind of reacting, right? It's it's a price taker. So certainly um, that becomes a challenge to foresee. But in the medium term, right? It's a regime shift, right? And 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 I think allocating into some defensive components. Or at least, you know, call it crisis alpha, and then you know, let's let we can have a long conversation how crisis alpha is defined by Katie. But anyway, I think it's a it's a good term, and I think you agree with that. Um, it should not be an act of regret, right? I genuinely I should not think that this is an act of regret. We should not necessarily be in a place to foresee what's going to happen next month. Uh, by all means, it's almost like a broken phone every month. You know, this thing is hitting like you know, a new all-time high uh, over the over the course of the year, right? You know, we could have had the same conversation six months ago, right? Um, you know, we could not necessarily foresee the next six months, but at least from a regime standpoint, we could foresee. So the way that I'm going to answer the question, and I'm going to go possibly to, um, I'm going to go back to whatever Andrew says, uh, which I, I I very much. You know, it re resonates pretty well with me. And and the point is that, you know, for those that haven't heard Andrew recently, his point is that historically we have seen those strategies being part of an alternatives bucket, being part of a diversifying bucket, being part of a good to have or possibly good complement. 
or possibly diversifying source. You know, we can have all sorts of different characterizations. It starts feeling more like essential, right? And now, if it's essential, we should not be asking whether it's late or not. If it's essential, we should not be asking about is it too late or is it not too late. If it's essential, we should not be thinking about an act of regret. Rather, it's more about how we strategically incorporate it into a portfolio, right? And by all means, to the extent that model portfolios and policy portfolios are more about a balanced allocation between equities and bonds, it's a good question how much you want to deviate. There's a good amount of career risk deviating from the benchmark, whatever the benchmark is. Possibly it's the time that the benchmark starts shifting. And I think this is a discussion to be had, but also a consideration for, for us allocators, right? And th th that's how I see it, right? My answer to is it late, it's more about should it possibly be a strategic allocation and therefore when you enter it shouldn't really matter? Completely agree. I just want to give you, you sort of, um, a, a, if you want, any final thoughts, Nick, you want to leave the audience with um, as we round this up? Final thoughts. I mean, I mean, my only final thought on on the trend topic would be that um, you know, there's 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 multiple ways we can look into an asset allocation problem, and ultimately, an asset allocation problem should have short term risk management capacities and long term capital appreciation. Right now, I think these are the two primary, in my view, features that we should be considering, and you know, the period is 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 quite unique right you know you know certainly not in my lifetime um you know i was born in september 1981 that was when rates were at 15 percent and then started going down like that's the math so the regime is shifting it felt that it has been shifting probably going to be here for some time um i cannot see how we can easily go back to what we had like two years back so my last thoughts would be let's let's be open-minded about what more dynamic and active allocation schemes can bring to total portfolios I think that's that's what I'm going to leave the audience with, and yeah, I think that's a good good place to uh, to uh, to wrap up. Absolutely. So, with that said, um, to all of you listening today, if you like these episodes, feel free to go and leave a rating and review. Uh, share the episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Nick, Rob, and me, thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged. And in the meantime. You can always go and check out the show notes and find more resources on the website. And not least, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.